Hey, everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking? The frog is here. Hey, man, we got the frog in there. <laughs> Amphibians. Uh, well, hey, Christina Costello is here. We haven't seen her in ages, man. Christina, nice to see you. Jokerfish says he's Team Frog. Well, who isn't? If you're not Team Frog, you're just a tool. You're just a tool, man. I don't care what you say. I'm team the Frog's awesome. Hey, you know, uh, that was my homage to uh, Stuttering John. I, <laughs> I did get to watch a little uh, <clears throat> dabble verse uh, today. God, he just keeps sinking lower and lower and lower, doesn't he? He's just so nice about women, isn't he? Uh, Stephanie says, I hope you're all eating good tonight. I made home, home, homemade uh, chili burgers at my uh, ma's request. Are you the one that drinks Tuaka, or is that was that somebody else? Is that that chick from Fort Smith? Um, Arkansas. Uh, people saying hi to each other. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, man, he just... He's not, not too cool to the ladies. I don't know. I, 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 uh, I actually have a teaching license uh, in the state of Utah. I don't even know if it's still good anymore. It probably isn't. Uh, you got to do continuing education and stuff. But when I was a teacher, I had a full teaching license. And I can tell you right now, there's no, no, any, any school that looks at even one episode of his program, it's over. You're not getting hired. Uh, the DDLD says Tuaka is nasty. We had a lady that would come in here. She was a really great, what was her name? Daphne Doris, begin with a D. And, and she loved Tuaka for some reason. Uh, no, the Arkansas lady drank that. I'm not really a drinker. I'm a midnight toker occasionally. Hey, 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 well, let's just keep that to yourself. Uh, Stephanie says, hi, how are you, everybody? What was her name? Dolores? I think it was Dolores. Uh, Trevor's here, says, I have CBEST in California to be a substitute teacher. Well, it's easy to be a substitute teacher. You know, you don't need a lot to be a substitute teacher. Uh, but to be a licensed educator, that has a different story. Uh, especially during COVID. Man, they would take everything. Lyndon says, but do you uh, have a 165 IQ like Stuttering John? I've never had my IQ tested. I don't know. I always went by grades in school. <laughs> I never... Um, it was Dolores. Yeah, Dolores. That was her name. She drank the Tuaka. And, and by the way, shamelessly hit on any dude that came in our chat room. Any dude at all that, that came in. I got to get something done with his hair. I really do. I'm cutting it tomorrow, I think. I'm going to cut. Um, but yeah, uh, I never saw the point of it personally. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> what's the, well, whatever. Some people are into that sort of thing. Um, not me at all, but we don't need no education. I mean, if he's got a 165 IQ, what good is it? Uh, bah, ha, 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 the young ones too. Cougar. Yeah, she would. She would hit on anything that said hi to her. And I'd always be in there because all the trolls would come in and I would go, Dolores, Dolores, Dolores that, that's one of the virulent troll. Don't do that. Uh, did you see Stuttering John yesterday eating and belching the whole show? That's every day, Trevor. Every day. Every single day. Eating and belching. And he does these things that he thinks are funny comedy bits where he pretends to sleep or eat soup, which we all know how I feel about soup. But anyway, he's disgusting. He is disgusting, man. He's ugh, just a sweaty, unshaven blob. Uh, and then he has the nerve after his horribly failed marriage and his inability or unwillingness to, uh, you know, meet the requirements of supporting his children uh, that, that I guess people have doxed him on here recently. He, he has the gall 
to point out other people's significant others and successful marriages and, and rate them. I don't understand that. In, in general, it, you should just keep your mouth shut about other people's marriages. It's none of your business. The trolls always wanted to marry me, though. I can dish it out and take it also, yes. No soup for you. Yeah, he's, he's just disgusting. He's disgusting. Anyway, we got a hell of a show planned for you here today. We got a, we got a hell of a show. We, we might have 15 or 16 people in here. Hell of a show we got planned. Um, hey, let me tell you about the Twilight Zone movie disaster. Huh? Uh, it was back on July 23rd, 1982, when John Landis was trying to make a little movie magic while shooting a scene for Twilight Zone, the movie. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know it's a movie that's basically four little movies in one movie. Now, Landis, John Landis, is a famous director, especially at the time. He was red hot. He directed Animal House and the Blues Brothers movie. Uh, and he, he was directing the first part, the first vignette, if you will, of the Twilight Zone movie called Time Out, which was starring acclaimed actor. Gosh, this guy was great. Vic Morrow. Probably most famous for the TV series Combat, but he was all over television, all over movies. He won an Emmy for Combat, and he had about 30 years on uh, screen and in film, to his credit. Now, the plot of Time Out, if you haven't seen the movie, no spoiler alerts here, but was that Vic Morrow, who was a tremendous bigot, was transported back to Vietnam, where he was... He looked like Vic Morrow, but everybody that saw him, mostly American troops in Vietnam, thought that he was Vietnamese. So it's that twilight thing where, you know, you're trapped in a nightmare, you know, type of thing. And uh, so he has to evade American troops and he has to protect two Vietnamese children from the troops as well, or at least he decides to. He's a change of heart. He's learning his lesson. And again, trapped in a nightmare, Twilight Zone fashion. Now, right out of the gate, John Landis was violating California law, child labor law, because the two child actors, seven-year-old uh, Micah Din Lee and six-year-old Renee Shin Yi Chen, were working without the necessary permits, which was only one of the labor violations on that day. The parents of the children, by the way, were never told that their kids would be around huge explosions, much less a helicopter. In fact, the kids were being paid on the hush-hush, under the table, sort of, because state law didn't even allow these kids to be working at night. This was a nighttime shoot. Uh, John Landis and the producers did not want to ask for an exemption because they were in a big hurry. They didn't want to wait. And they didn't think they'd get permission due to the massive explosions that were going to be around these kids. Very close proximity. Uh, they were shooting out at a pretty well-known movie ranch called Indian Dunes, where they shot things like The Color Purple, Escape from New York, MacGyver, China Beach. It was a very wide open area that had um, sort of brushy, mountainous or hills, uh, sort of area, and because it was so wide open and it was away from Los Angeles, although within the 30-mile radius that has to do with the way people are uh, paid in uh, the studio business out there, uh, it allowed for more pyrotechnics, okay? And it looked remote because you didn't get all the lights of Los Angeles and stuff out there, okay? So this was shot at night. Vic Morrow was supposed to carry the two kids from this village across a river, uh, was shallow, kind of, it's up to his waist or in between his thighs and his knees, uh, while U.S. soldiers in the scene were ostensibly pursuing him in a helicopter that was hovering above them. Now, this chopper, a Bell UH-1 in Iroquois, 
was being piloted by a NOM vet. Now, disclosure here, I used to work for Bell Helicopter. Many of you may know that, but a UH-1 is was largely a transport helicopter. It's not the smaller one like a Huey. It's a larger helicopter. Unfortunately, the helicopter was hovering just 25 feet above the ground. They wanted it in tight. They wanted it to look exciting, you know, for the movie. Uh, and it was near a large mortar effect. Well, <clears throat> when the helicopter swiveled 180 degrees to the left f to get a better camera shot, because they were shooting from the helicopter as well, the mortar effect was detonated with the tail rotor directly above it. Okay, so the tail rotor, you guys have all seen helicopters. That's the back of the helicopter that's got the propeller that is sideways, for lack of a better term. Okay. The metal top of this mortar effect hit the tail rotor, detaching it completely from the tail. Now, that little sideways thing is what provides the stability for the helicopter. So it doesn't do something called auto-rotate, which makes it just go in a circle. Remember those little maple leaf things you get as a kid that looked like a little feather almost, and a seed at the end, you drop it, and it would just go in a circle? That's auto-rotation. Okay, if you don't have that stabilizing tail rotor, your helicopter is just going to go in a circle out of control. So that's what happened. The helicopter spun out of control. Just at that time, Moro had dropped young Chen. And as he was reaching back for her, the helicopter crashed, landing on top of Vic Moro and the two child actors. Now, Vic Moro and Lee were decapitated. The actual rotors on top of the helicopter hit them and, you know. Chen was crushed by the chopper skid, which landed directly on top of the poor child, and they all three died almost instantly. Six people aboard the helicopter were injured, but, but they did survive. So, um, what I'm going to show you now, some of you may not want to watch this, but I am going to show you the actual footage of what happened. Now, this footage is intercut, so they were running more than one camera at a time. You don't want to have to do takes and takes and takes. So he's running with the children. They have close-ups of that, and then there's a wide shot of the helicopter and all the explosions. So I'm going to show you that real quickly. Um, I should probably remove the sound uh, just in the interest of, you know, not freaking too many people out, but um, yeah. So let me just turn the sound off here real quickly. And let me do this. So here we're going to see the wide shot of the deal. Um, and that's where we're going to begin. Okay, now this doesn't last very long. As you can see, the helicopter is in the upper right. If you look into the very middle of that river, you see sort of a blob there. That's Vic Morrow and the two kids, but we will intercut. So, so here we go. Um, helicopters above him, huge explosion. Okay, you can see Vic Morrow with the kids running with him, and he's having trouble. He's in deep water. Okay, and, and so the helicopter's out of control, and as you can see, those rotors just, I mean, they, they, I'll show it to you one more time. Uh, there they are, and bam, the, the rotors just directly hit them. One more time, not to be gruesome about it, but you do, you do need to, to know what happened for the rest of what I'm going to tell you. So, uh, yeah, that's what happened. This is the close-up shot. This is the lawyer, actually, that defended uh, John Landis. Let's get rid of him. Um, and um, I'll put, this is the uh, wreckage uh, the next day in the light of day. If uh, StreamYard will cooperate, there we go. Um, there was huge amounts of litigation on this thing. The defense in the subsequent trial said that the explosions went off at the wrong time. But the pilot claimed he was trying to leave the shot because there, there were explosions going on that were too great. He did not expect explosions of and that was a huge thing at the trial uh, of that magnitude and or proximity to him and this is a nom vet by the way uh and they lost control of the helicopter and then the tail rotor went out 
Landis was criticized for dismissing concerns and warnings about this stunt. More than one person said, are, are we too close? Are we? And he just was like, hey, it's not, nothing to worry about. The children's families collected millions of dollars from several lawsuits, uh, civil lawsuits. The defense actually tried to blame Morrow for not looking up at the helicopter, claiming he had five seconds to avoid the helicopter and the, it drew outrage from the prosecutors and the world in general. Uh, the prosecutors were like, the man was knee deep to waist deep in water. And you know, we, they, they, if you read the transcript, they just went apoplectic. Uh, Steven Spielberg co-produced the Twilight Zone movie with John Landis, those, those two directors who, you know, were the hottest directors in Hollywood at the time. Um, 1983, uh, he, the crash forever ended their friendship. They were very good friends and that crash ended it forever. Spielberg considered it the producers and the director's responsibility to protect every member of the crew and cast. Uh, no movie is worth dying for was his quote when the trial went on. So um that is what happened on the set of twilight zone the movie now the small film time out that vic morrow was in is in the movie you know they did away with that final scene and it, it's in there vic morrow's in the movie it's in the you know so anyway that is what happened with Twilight Zone, the movie. There you go. <clears throat> so let's get back to our chat room here. And uh, that that footage to me is just chilling to see the the because the rotors hit the right. I mean, uh, uh, Lyndon says half his food hit the floor. Guess that's how he feeds his cat. Sven Dunkel says no woman can afford me. Well, that's quite a claim. Uh, it's not a party till Wild Bill sneaks in there. <laughs> yeah, the Wild Bill. There he is. Uh, people saying hi to him. People just, just saying hi. Terry Nee says, no, frog. Come on, man. The frog's the coolest. Uh, I don't know what that is, Jenna. Uh, no chicken? No chicken? I don't know what's going on there. Uh, love chicken. Love, I, 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 you guys, you got me. I'm not great at emojis, uh, but I can say great. That's a uh, thumbs up on the frog beer and frog and peace. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Stephanie says, talk nerdy to me. Physics. Yes. Physics. Uh, evening Stacy. Uh, did anyone go to jail for this? Nobody went to jail. John Landis was cleared of this when the, okay, the, sometimes I do these stories and you guys might think all I know about it is in my little report. No, sadly, I super research these things. Um, there had just been some new guidelines regarding the use of aircraft in the movie business to increase safety. However, they did not pertain to helicopters. After this happened, the guidelines were widened to also cover helicopters. Now, the NTSB found that the cause of the accident was that the helicopter was too close to those explosives and then, of course, the loss of the tail rotor. That was their determination on the cause of the crash. But they're not looking to place blame. They're just looking to establish what happened. During the trial, there was a lot of back and forth over who was technically responsible for what happened in terms of the helicopter's proximity to the explosions, the size of the explosions. Uh, John Landis was like, I'm the director. I'm just going to request things. It's up to the other people to tell me no we can't or shouldn't do that. And nobody ever said that to me. 
Did anybody say that, that this might not be the greatest idea in the world? Well, yeah, they, but, but people say things are going to be difficult to me all the time. It, it, they have to say no, can't do it. And so nobody went to jail. Now, that being said, huge civil litigation, gigantic amounts of civil litigation. Vic Morrow's family, hooey, boy, did they get money. And uh, so did the family of the two children that were uh, killed in the crash as well. Um, so, you know, they tried to play, everybody basically tried to place blame on everybody else. Um, good evening, fellow gully heads. It's Johnny Brooks, who was the first one in the room, by the way. Um, evening, Johnny. Interesting indeed, says our good friend Christine Costello. Um, the oxygen got sucked out of the engine, I think. No frog mobbing. <laughs> no frog mobbing. The frog is, is you can't even... There's not even a way to cal. I mean, John with his stupid Mensa and all that. The frog is talented beyond measure. The amount of stuff he does, the speed at which he does it, the appropriateness of it, the man is worth his weight in gold. Lyndon says, Tom, I've seen the scene many times, but never the actual strike. Five seconds, my butt. Well, you just saw the actual strike. Uh, Stacy said, did I miss this? Did the helicopter pilot live? All six passengers in the helicopter survived. Uh, they were injured. Some of them were injured. No one was critically injured, but everyone survived. Um, Sven Dunkel, Ups Tail Rotor, missed that part. Yeah, yeah. The uh, mortar effect blew the tail rotor off of the back of the helicopter, and that's what caused that crazy spin out. And... I, I don't want to, it, it's almost incalculably bad luck for those rotors to have hit exactly where they were. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the one child was killed by the skid, you know, and the, the, I mean, the helicopter came down right up, right on top of them, so. Paz says, hey, Tom, sorry I'm late. You, Paz, we go over this every time. You're never late. Nobody's ever late to this show. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is the first time you've ever heard the story? Oh, it was big news for a while there. It was, it was, uh, and, and by the way, kind of destroyed the movie career of John Landis, uh, who was, at the time, a super hot director. Now, he's done things since. I think he did the Don Rickles Project. He's done other things, but never as, as big as he was. I mean, he was gigantic. He really, really, really was. Um, let's get you filmography here. As a director, okay? He did Kentucky Fried Movie, Animal House, Blues Brothers, American Werewolf in London, uh, Trading Places with Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, and then the Twilight Zone movie. So all those other ones, smash hits, you've heard of them all. Then Into the Night, black comedy with Jeff Goldblum and Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Spies Like Us, okay, he did Spies Like Us. Clue, but he was only ex an executive. He directed Three Amigos. He directed Amazon Women on the Moon. He did direct Coming to America. He directed a movie called Oscar with uh, Stallone that was just terrible. Directed a movie called Innocent Blood that's... Eh. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 3. I mean, oh, how the mighty have fallen. He directed a movie called The Stupids. He did Blues Brothers 2000. He did a movie called Susan's Plan. And then he did uh, Burke in here. He has not directed a movie since 2010. Incidentally, the, the movie that he directed before 2010 was in 1998. So this, you know, completely destroyed his, uh, you know, directing career. Um, 
He did, he's done some television, but his biggest probably thing, uh, he, he did three episodes of Psych, which is a, a, a show I really love, but uh, Mr. Warmth, the Dom Rickles Project, he was the director of that. And, um, you know, he's the director of Superhero Kindergarten now, an animated feature. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's what happened to uh, John Landis. And, and Spies Like Us is a, is a nice little movie, but he basically called in favors of Aykroyd and Chase and all the people that kind of hung out in that, in that uh, realm. But he never got the budgets that he got with the Blues Brothers and all these other movies and he never returned to the upper echelon of Hollywood directors, which he was clearly in. He was so hot, you know, uh, trading places. Are you kidding me? That's uh, Animal House. What? Uh, you know, Blues Brothers movie. I mean, he was, he was on fire. Spies Like Us was awesome. It was awesome. I do love that movie. I, I do have to say that. Kentucky Fried Movie was horrible, but as a young lad, I enjoy some parts of it. I know what you're talking about, Terry Nee. I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and uh, Kentucky Fried Movie, I, I own it on DV, DVD. It, it is not a class, I mean, but there are elements of it that show super imagination and are funny. It's super uneven. I'll be the first to you know agree to that. But, uh, you know, it, uh, it's the kind of thing that you would give a young director a lot of props for. Um, <laughs> Terry Nee, you dirty birdie, says Stacy. Lyndon says, Tom, Twilight Zone or Outer Limits? <sighs> if you're going to talk about the series as a whole, it's Twilight Zone. If you were to take the top... 10 episodes of each one, Outer Limits would give it a run for its money. Uh, <laughs> I thought Kentucky Fried Movie was great. There are parts of it that were great. Danny Workham said, I love the Groove Tube. People often confuse the Groove Tube and Kentucky Fried Movie because they're little vignette movies. Mm. But they're both pretty good. Trevor has to say hi to Zombie on my chat room. Like they never talk. Um, so yeah. By the way, in the background here is the trial going on. And there, the guy with the beard there is John Landis. It's John Landis. Uh, yes, I still confuse them. One of the things about Animal House, it's you may not know this about Animal House, but I'm going to tell you. It's 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 kind of a cool uh, story. I have the Animal House like extra feature edition, right? Um, John Landis, when he was growing up, had a friend that, uh, let's see here if I can find this. And his friend was the son or the nephew, I can't remember which, of Elmer Bernstein. Now, that name may not mean much to any of you. However, uh, Elmer Bernstein uh, is one of the most famous uh, composers for movie soundtracks in the history of the movies. Here are some movies that Elmer Bernstein did the soundtrack for. Man with the Golden Arm, which is a famous Sinatra film. The Ten Commandments. The Magnificent Seven. Dun, 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 Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird. The Great Escape. True Grit. Okay? Do you see what I'm saying here? And he's done 
probably over a hundred films. Elmer Bernstein is a the Tin Star, which is a favorite favorite movie of mine. Birdman of Alcatraz. Uh, let's see, I did The Great Escape. The Sons of Katie Elder. The Silencers. Cast a Giant Shadow. Uh, Return of the Seven. Uh, let's see here. Big Jake, See No Evil, Cahill U.S. Marshal, uh, The Trial of Billy Jack, Billy Jack, The Shootist, Slapshot. You see what I'm saying here? Elmer Bernstein is legendary. Okay, so John Landis is a family friend of Elmer Bernstein. And when he's making Animal House, he has no money. There's no stars in it. I mean, John Belushi ended up becoming a star. But it's a nothing little film, uh, you know, kind of vulgar, etc. He goes to Elmer Bernstein and says, would you do the score for this movie? And he goes, do you really understand my work? I do serious films. He goes, that's just it. I want you to score this. I don't want you to be cookie zany wacky comedy score. I want you to score this like a war movie or or a spy movie or uh, I want it to be serious. You're not going to believe me, although I do have a degree in film from Ball State University. Um, comedies were not scored that way until Animal House. After Animal House, the scores were majestic and stuff. So anyway, just a little side note for uh, Animal House. Uh, Stacy says, Tom, are you a Star Wars or Star Trek guy? I'm Trek all the way. Trek all the way. If you want me to tell you why, say so in the chat. Because I have a lot to say about that. But... If you don't want to know why, I don't want to bore you. Bore you, bore you. Tyler Grieve is here. Hello, Tyler. Good to see you. Uh, Danny Workman says, I remember reading Animal House stories in National Lampoon Magazine. No. Terry Nee says, but imagine going through life with the name Elmer Bernstein. Imagine getting Academy Award after Academy Award for soundtrack. He must have been named after his grandfather. Uh, Warhammer 40K all day says... <laughs> Sven Knuckle. I have no idea what that means. Stacy Allen says, I need to know why. Thanks. Okay. Star Wars is princesses and princes and fantasies and the force and all of that stuff. It's stupid names of, you know character is the bar scene the only legitimate thing about the star wars deal is han solo okay because he didn't seem like he buys into all that nonsense anyway star trek is about ethics justice serious social issues uh real science um friendship camaraderie it's it's the star trek is so much more legitimate now if you like star wars i have nothing against you go like it but it, it to me is for children it's kid stuff you know and uh you know dun, 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 dun. <laughs> i am your father come on you know Star Trek is almost Shakespearean in the issues that it deals with. Um, let me see here. Elmer Fudd. Zombie, you're much better on Trevor's show than you are in my chat room. May the farce be with you. The Schwartz. The Force is no different than any other fictional religion. Is it even a religion? I mean, there's a dark side of the Force. Uh, I'm not going to Google that. Uh, original Star Trek for me. I like all the Star Treks. But if you like the original Star Trek, there is a thing, and I think you can see the episodes for free on YouTube, 
called Star Trek Continues. And a bunch of people got together and made 13 episodes that are identical. The sets are identical. The, unif the uniforms are identical. They even have one of the cast members from the original, uh, one of the original shows, uh, the guy that was Zeus or whatever. It's, they completely replicated the original Star Trek. It's called Star Trek Continues. Check it out. It will blow your mind how perfectly, and the stories are very original Star Trek. Uh, you can buy technically accurate schematics of the Enterprise. You can also learn to speak Klingon. That's cool. Um, in the name of art. Okay. And one through four on the Trek movies. I, I like I like everything. Um, okay. There's only one war. Okay, that looks like some sort of a risk-based space game. Wake me up when they make a movie. Um, I'll check it out. Yeah, Star Trek continues. It's amazing. Uh, Goat says, wait, are you saying Star Trek didn't have stupid character names? No, 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 no. no. Hold on. Here's, here's all I need to say about Star Wars. Jar Jar Binks. No. Tom, do you like Anson Mount as Captain Pike? He was phenomenal on AMC's Hell on Wheels. Yeah, I do like Anson Mount as Captain Pike. I do. I do. I'm talking about the first three. The first three Star Wars, and when you and that's the other thing about Star Wars. When you say the first three, you mean the first three that were released? Because I think those are the middle three of the... It's just... You know. Ah, the job... Star Wars is also a tremendous, just a marketing scheme. There were 3,000 licensed products for one of the Star Wars movies. Uh, released four, five, six. I don't even know if I've seen all of them. I've seen the first one. It's not a bad movie, as movies go. But let's put it this way. If the Federation ran into the Empire, okay, the Death Star and all that, that battle would last four seconds. It wouldn't even be funny. I mean, come on. They beat the Borg, for crying out loud. Um, I went to Lucasfilm's headquarters in San Francisco. It was spectacular. Uh, made me a fan immediately. Well, the industrial light and magic and all that other stuff, I mean, the effects, yeah, are great. Uh, Star Wars needs effects. Star Trek, you can get by without them. Uh, didn't they insert Greek gods into the next generation? Well, there was, there was Greek gods in uh, the original series. And, and one of those guys that played a Greek god, all young and, and vibrant, is in Star Trek Continues when he's old. It's, it's, they brought it full circle. It's really cool. Uh, and the talking slug, Pizza the Hut, yeah. Uh, Diana Jean O'Brien is here. She's from Shrewsbury, Shropshire, in uh, over across the Blighty. If you like Star Wars, I encourage you to like it. I, I, there's, there's a lot of great things about it. They had great effects. I did like it that they brought back sort of the old '40s serial type thing that they ended up taking to Indiana Jones hardcore. But I, there, there's things I like about it. Don't get me wrong. But if you're asking me which one I like better, I, I am in, man, Star Trek, all that stuff. Uh, I'm way into it. Way into it. And maybe it's because Star Trek was on when I was a kid. You know, I don't know. 
Uh, Stephanie Lindley says, my ex-husband had the Klingon symbol as his only tattoo when I met him. I should have taken that as a sign. Giant dingleberry he was. Well, divorce is a dish best served cold. <laughs> Care Bear beat the Death Star. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Wild Bill says, I would rather watch Spaceballs. We're hitting plaid. Jokerfish says... That kid from St. Elsewhere didn't get into st involved in Star Trek. I bet he did, somehow. You mean Tommy Westfall? The Tommy Westfall universe? Been to our local pub in memory of my sister tonight. Tell you more privately. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Brent Hollywood Show says, I'm, it's subjective. I'm going to have a what's better debate, but your argument is flawed. I'm a fan of yours and enjoy your takes. But how is a Klingon any more absurd than a princess conceptually? Well, I think it's less absurd. The Klingons were a civilization of warriors based on the habitat they grew up into, and therefore that was a world of, you know, people that were, you know, bloodthirsty warriors. And that's something the Federation of Planets, who were not that way, had to deal with when they and the Romulans and the rest of them um, but that's you know that's that's a that's a political ethos that's a a there's a difference between science fiction and science fantasy Star Trek is science fiction Star Wars is science fantasy uh, the only good things I can say about Star Wars or Star Trek is I don't watch either well there you go Wesley Crusher is a worse character than Jar Jar. You know, you might have a point there, but but I don't think you do. Just on the voice alone. Jar Jar was so clearly inserted into that universe to be a marketing ploy to appeal to kids. Wesley Crusher was just a deus ex machina, annoying thing. And by the way, to, to, and one's a movie, one's a series, but, but to the credit of the next generation, they phased old Wesley out pretty quickly. Uh, Space Herpes is back. Ewoks better than Klingons. I don't think so. Man, every single one of those Star Wars movies, the Federation would just come in and wipe the floor with them. The Ewoks, please. They wouldn't even be... What's the one with all the robots in it that, that are trying to take over or whatever? Spock would just figure out how to deactivate them all at once. And tying ropes around the big elephant-y things and stuff. They, the Star, Star Trek would have figured out. It wouldn't have even been funny. Uh, the gift that keeps on giving again and again. Uh, Ewoks would be more like Tribbles on Trek. Kind of. Kind of. Ooh, X Machine is a great AI movie. Jar Jar Binks is my Ray DeVito. <laughs> Jar Jar. Jar Jar is kind of Stevie Lewis. Uh, Battlestar Galactica. Now see, Batter, Battlestar Galactica, both of them, the first one and the second, are really good. Um, well, the second one got soap opera-ish. But Hugh says, I used to have a problem with Klingons until my wife introduced me to the Brazilian wax. Um, <clears throat> Worf. Worf's one of the best characters in the, the whole thing. Um you know, <laughs> still can't get over it. I will admit that probably my least favorite thing about the Star Trek universe is the Wesley Crusher deus ex machina end of the episode. Hey, I just remembered an old Starfleet manual. We can reroute the... Oh, come on, man. Come on. Firefly is my favorite... Uh, is my fan space kind of, I have it on DVD. Firefly is super good. Hey, and I'll throw an olive branch out to your Star Wars people. I loved The Mandalorian. Really liked The Mandalorian. Okay, here's an old joke for you. 
Yes. What does the enterprise have with toilet a common with toilet paper? Um, but the whole who shot first. Star Trek also. I mean, it's been around for almost 60 years now. And they've managed, I mean, you have the original series, Next Generation, um, Deep Space Nine. Then my favorite series, I think of all the Star Trek series, is Voyager. Because they're off by themselves. They're, you know. Uh, even Enterprise, I liked. And then all the new ones they've released since. It just doesn't stop, you know, uh, accumulating fans. And the song Star Trekkin' Across the Universe. Ser Serenity was a good movie, too, to follow up Firefly. Fly Firefly was really good. Uh, what was the one that I used to like on sci-fi? Was, was it called The Vox? Or the it was the giant living spaceship? The Rex? Was it The Rex? Uh, this is how Liberty dies. Natalie Portman's Lion, episode two of Memory Serves. A shot at George Bush, who was president at the time. What Lucas was implying there was clear. Um, Star Wars dealt with real issues, too. Yeah, right. Not like Star Trek did. Have you not seen the episode of Star Trek with the, the two guys that have black on one side, white on the other? And they're like, why are you fighting? Can't you see? His, there's white on this side. He's different than me. You know, just uh, too much actual social issues and, and uh, ethics and things. That's the basis of, of Star Trek, you know. It's it's not an add-on or a throwaway or, or something of that nature. It's dramatic. Oh, here's another one for you. Some of the greatest science fiction writers of all time wrote Star Trek. Harlan Ellison. Um, Norman Spinrid. I, mean, I could go down the list. Some of the greatest authors of all time. Um, some people prefer not to be preached to. Well, there you get your Tribbles episode. Uh, you know. And they're not preaching to you. It's, it's, a, it's a drama play. And, and, and uh, the Enterprise going to the planet that's uh, Chicago gangsters because they'd been left a book about it or whatever. It's just too much good stuff. You know, It's people get so, you know, territorial. It's like, hey, if you like your thing, like it. Go ahead. I'm not stopping you. I just said there's some good things about it. You know, anybody familiar with the late 80s, early 90s British space series Red Dwarf? No, but I am familiar with the, I think it was early 70s British series called UFO, which I would play the theme song for. It's so cool, but I don't want to get dinged again. Uh, Uhura Smooch Captain Kirk. I think, I think that might have been the first interracial inter kiss on American broadcast television. Uh, 42. I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, okay, Gully, don't lose your cool. You're allowed to look certain. I know I am. You're not telling me anything I don't know. Some people don't like to be preached to while you're preaching to me. Um, Star Trek just puts it out there. They don't, uh, you know, tell you what to think. I don't tell you what to think. Plus, it's the same. It's the same core characters in the original series, and it's the same. And those characters made I don't know how many successful films, um, and you just get used to it. Forty-two. Okay. Yeah, still, still don't know what you're talking about. Did you enjoy the show Lost? I loved Lost. Absolutely loved it. You know. My girlfriend at the time told me I was Sawyer, and that's the only reason that I liked it. 
that's not the truth. I liked it anyway. Uh, yeah, if you like Star Wars, go like it. I used to watch UFO back in the day, but scared me, Tom. And those chicks up in that space station with like the purple hair and stuff. Stephanie uh, Marshawn Lindley uh, says, oh my God, Bob Williams, how's Rosie? Is Morty Vicker in here? I don't see Morty Vicker. Lost was good until it wasn't. Well, I'm not one of these people, like for instance, Lost season four wasn't that great, and then it got back on the wheels, and then the ending a lot of people didn't like, and like, so I'm not one of these people. It's like uh, the Sopranos ending. I can't throw away all of the awesomeness of a series just because I didn't like a certain part of it. I, I don't do that, but that being said, the ending was pretty... Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, Brett says, I said it was subjective. I don't get tribal about things. I'm merely saying you basically said Star Wars was silly, and it is, but pretend Star Trek had legitimacy is silly too. Oh, really? Huh. Where did the design for the flip phone come from? Do you want me to go down the list of inventions and things that came out of Star Trek? <laughs> it's kind of long. I don't think that's silly. You know, I don't see a lot of lightsabers at Home Depot. Uh, the answer to everything. 42. Oh, okay. Hubby's a Star Trek geek, says Diana Gina Bryan. Uh, Wild Bill says, I was sent an Enterprise TV prop that had all the lights to it that worked six feet long for one of my Cali friends. Wow. Uh, I liked everything about Sopranos, even the ending. I, I didn't mind the ending at all. Toby McGroby's here. He says, hey, guys. I like it when William Shatner and Mark Hamill get in Twitter battles about which, which is better, Star Trek or Star Wars. <laughs> and I recently have liked, because for a while they didn't bring them back, but I liked when um, Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford came back into the thing. That I liked. Liked it quite a bit. And again, loved Mandalorian. Love it. So, you know. Uh, but again, Brett, it's really the difference between science fiction and science fantasy. That is the difference between those two franchises. That's it in a nutshell. Nothing more needs to be said. So... Uh, Trek by light years. Yes. By light years. While Bill says, I used to be a big Trekkie. The things I had for it would have filled another room like the stuff that's in the room I'm in now. You guys should see Wild Bill's room. It's, it's nothing but severed heads. <laughs> it's nothing but heads of various horror and slasher film. <coughs> <coughs> Who is a stronger mouse? Oh, Super Mouse or Spider-Man, Superman, Frog? I don't know what you're talking about. You mean Mighty Mouse? Here I come to say the day. It, what, nobody can tell me what that, what that show was that was on sci-fi. Was it the, the Lex? It was called The Lex. That was it. God, I love that show. Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse is pretty damn strong. But, uh, you know. Adam Ant. Don't you mean Atom Ant? <laughs> Adam Ant sings Goody Two Shoes <laughs> and Prince Charming. Up and Adam, Atom Ant. I think, I, think you're, I think you're referring to Atom Ant. I'm just going to type that in the... Yeah, there you go. It's got my name in it and everything. Uh, but yeah, you know, space, the final frontier. Anyway, Germany, it was super mouse or Uber mouse, Uber mouse. Oh uh, gosh. 
What do we got here? Seven minutes left. I don't think we're going to be able to call Trevor today. Uh, but it's an interesting discussion. It, it's, uh, it's an interesting discussion. There's uh, nothing wrong with any of it. By the way, have you guys seen some of the fan movies that have been made about Star Trek? Just just go it's a fan made movie Star Trek on on uh, YouTube. It's like hour and a half, two hour long movies. Um, did I tell you how much I miss music? I don't know. I'm not getting that. Trevor says I'm here. I know Trevor, but I've only got five and a half minutes left. Sorry. We'll, we'll get you tomorrow on Friday when nobody watches this show, when absolutely no one watches. And I do a show for no reason at all. <laughs> for app, even less of a reason than I do. Oh, by the way, like, share, subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. Please give me a little click. Please, for the love of Mike. Uh, if you want to go to the Tom Gully show, there's a million podcasts there. None of them involve this horrible argument we're having over Star Wars or Star Trek. Uh, and there's plenty of other stuff there. There's also uh, paypal.me slash Tom Gully show. If you'd like to just help us out financially a little bit, that would be awesome. It's a nice boat of confidence and it makes me feel like maybe someday if I get monetized, it'll be all worth it. Um, and then there's other things. But like, share, subscribe. Uh, let's see. Okay, Lyle Fenimore, my old co-host, will be here. I'm really looking forward to that. Christina Costello says, "I'm gonna. I'm so gonna try to be here tomorrow." Christina, we'd we'll love to have you when uh, when when you can, and if you can't, then that's fine too. You know, Christina Costello and I are huge fans of Elvis Costello. You know, <coughs> we're giant Elvis Costello fans. Stephanie Lynn says, I heart the Tom Gully show and all the chat friends. Yes. A close group. Wabo says, tomorrow I have better things to do at this time, like scrubbing toilets and churning the butter at the same time. Cool show. Thanks. Uh, thank you, zombie. Uh, tag me if you make it in here first. Okay. I love Costello. Yeah, I'm a huge Elvis Costello fan. Who, uh, they use his music in The Sopranos. Complicated Shadows. Uh, another great show, Gully. Well, thank you, Stacy. A compliment from you. I know you give those out with an eyedropper, so that's that's uh, really awesome. Big D killed Star Wars. Big D, Dallas? Everything is less than zero. Dun -dun 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 -dun. I have right now, right now over in my office on the coffee table in front of the big screen, all of the next generation Blu-ray movies. And here's another thing. J.J. Abrams, who's a big Star Wars fan, tries as hard as he can to kill the Star Trek franchise. He tries to turn it into Star Trek so bad. I mean, Star Wars. Elvis got in trouble on SNL, but they invited him back. No, this song isn't right. It's not right. And then they were, yeah, they were doing less than zero, and then they went into uh, Radio Radio, which they were expressly forbidden to play. And he was banned for about 20 years or so. Exp explain how lizard people in space isn't just as fantasy Star Wars. There's lizard people in Star Wars. Of course, there's going to be different races of people. It's the subject matter. They see, I can't have this discussion with a Star Wars person because they're, they're not into context. You know, they're into fantasy. So it's, it's just pointless to have a discussion. Well, you guys have aliens too. Yeah, that's not the point. We had Frank Gorshin and uh, the other guy that was a guest on my show, Lou Antonelli, Antonini, eh, that, that were black on one side, white on the other, and it wasn't until the, they, they realized 
the, the different sides and it was prejudice. It was a show about prejudice. It wasn't a show about lizards. Uh, as fantasy as Star Wars. No. No. Uh, wormholes, warp drives, black holes, communicators, transporters. That's all science fiction. It's not science fantasy. The difference. Again, you can't have the discussion with somebody that's not smart enough to have it. It's uh, what about the lizard people here on Earth? Exactly. That's why Star Trek is also science fantasy. You are a, an imbecile. You really are. The, the list of inventions, actual tangible inventions that have come out of Star Trek is staggering. The way that the flip phone looks from Star Trek. It's science. There's science involved. Warp drive, warp travel, warp speed, transport. Are you not getting this? You're not tracking? You are a moron. Sarah, I put it in a language that you can understand. Put it in a language that you'll be able to... You guys made my day. Much love to you all. Mean it. Uh, I, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you think you have any sort of grasp over this. This is a generally recognized precept of the two programs all across the board by critics and the actual originators of these things. If you don't get it, I can't help you. Uh, Star Trek is uh, science fiction and has become nonfiction. Exactly. Star Wars had Roombas on the Death Star. You're right. It's so steeped in science. Uh, I'm not a Star Wars person merely because I enjoy the films. I'm always objective and open to be proven wrong. Star Wars Episode 1 and 2 were like watching C-SPAN. Highly political. <laughs> not really. Not really. They just hearkened back to the days of radio serials where there were bad guys and good guys. That's all. That's the thing about Star Trek. There are people that they have legitimate beefs with that you don't hate because they're not bad guys. They're trying to survive. And well, like the planet where they got rid of war and all the wars were done on computer. And so if your area was hit by a fake computer strike, you were required to walk into a disintegrator machine. And that's when Kirk comes in and says, we're going to destroy the computers that do this because you need to know that war is messy and it is disgusting and it is wrong. And you've made it absolutely uh, hermetically sealed. I mean, these are issues. They're not, there's a lot of times when the protagonist in a Star Trek, they end up solving their problem for them it that you don't hate them it's not th there's nothing good about the death star the first word in it is death yeah star wars had robots and androids now we have robots everywhere and cell phones called what gully androids yeah that that was done on star trek a long time before star wars came around uh, Tara will never fail. Hell yeah, brother. Um, don't, don't make me play. Oh gosh, now I'm going to have to do it. Uh, let's see here if I can find it. There we go. Yeah, books. I'm going to have to do this. I didn't want to have to do this. I'm going to have to do this. You're beating your head, Tom. So you're not going to sway Star Wars fans. I'm with you. Well, I'm not trying to sway them. They like what they like. They're just, they're just getting it wrong about science versus fantasy is all. I got a degree in this. All right, let me see here. This is one of my favorite things about Star Trek. This is one of my favorite scenes. 
Let's see here. Let's just go ahead and. Uh -huh. Hopefully it sounds up. Kirk, always getting drunk. You, Kirk? Yes. What is all this? I figured we'd be spending some time together. So oh, I moved in. I hope I'm not crowding you. What's the matter? Don't you like folks? Oh, I like them fine. But a computer takes less space. Huh. A computer, huh? I got one of these in my office. Contains all the precedents. A synthesis of all the great legal decisions written throughout time. I never use it. Why not? I've got my own system. Books, young man. Books, thousands of them. If time wasn't so important, I'd show you something. My library. Thousands of books. What would be the point? This is where the law is. Not in that homogenized, pasteurized, synthesizing. Do you want to know the law? The ancient concepts in their own language? Learn the intent of the men who wrote them? From Moses to the tribunal of Alpha Three. Books. You have to be either an obsessive crackpot who's escaped from his keeper or Samuel T. Cogley, attorney of law. You're right on both counts. Need a lawyer? I'm afraid so. There you go. Concepts, by golly. And uh, what else was there? Did I not mention that the greatest science fiction authors of our time, the new age of science fiction writers, Harlan Ellison, Norman Spinroom, Robert Block, all wrote episodes of Star Trek. Huh. How'd that happen? Anyway. Let's, let's get through here. Uh, I prefer Isaac Asimov. Nothing wrong with Asimov or Ray Bradbury. Nothing wrong with those guys. Uh, if only we had some Romulan ale. Well, Romulan ale is not legal, as you know, in most, unless you're Scotty. I saw that guy in a movie the other day, Johnny Cool. He was also in uh, the Casablanca. Uh, not Casablanca. Uh, the Blackbird. The Maltese Falcon. That's Elisha Cook Jr. I, I won't even get into the legendary actors that have been in Star Trek because Star Wars legitimately has had some incredible actors too. Um, you said that already. I know. I had to say it again because dumbass came in here and started talking about its fantasy. Um, L. Ron Hubbard was a writer. <laughs> well, yes, he was. Uh, Tom, can we talk about shingles? <laughs> Who do you think I am? Terry Bradshaw? Oh, gosh. Talk about Valtrex. All right. Hey, uh, tomorrow night's a Friday show that no one will watch. Maybe I can figure out a way to make it about Star Trek or something, and we could have a big argument. Uh, I'll open the phone lines. People can call in. Um, and, and you can use your flip phone, which was designed based on the communicator. But with all that being said, I gotta eat, I'm hungry. And uh, the only thing left to say is, till next time, we'll see you next time. Right out of my